Recently, um, a couple of researchers have found a, a big hack in Tetra, which is a system for radio um, that is used all over the world um, for security critical operations, police forces, military apparatus, but also critical infrastructure like trains, dams, um, electricity nets, you know, important stuff. So this should be like encrypted and really heavily secure. And exactly. You want it to be secure. You want people not to know what the communication is. You don't want criminals, for example, knowing what the police is saying to each other. Um, and you don't want uh, people to be able to insert messages. You don't want people to send a message saying, open the floodgates. Tetra is a proprietary standard supported by uh, a European institute called Etsy, Standards Institute. And I think it's a strange choice to have a proprietary standard. And I think uh, I can explain to you why. Um, this is also a point that the people um, that found the vulnerabilities are, are very strongly making themselves as well. The well-known algorithms like uh, AES or all the big ones, uh, we all know how they work, right? The schematics are available online, someone can implement it, um, and then you can check whether the implementation follows the design, and everyone around the world can have a look at the design and see if there's any security flaws. And the answer isn't always going to be no. Um, typically, people will eventually find some weaknesses and sometimes they will find big flaws. And if this is the case, we can update the standard, we can make the changes appropriately, and criminals have a, a short time window in which they can potentially exploit it, but it won't be the case that there's a massive gap for, for decades that no one seems to know about. Um, and that's exactly what happened in, in this case. Tetra is used for networks that are built out of radio stations. So you don't want to rely on the internet, uh, but you want to have your own radio stations and they're communicating with each other, potentially relaying messages as well. Um, and this is of course very useful for the applications that we just talked about, right? Uh, you don't want the police to suddenly be unable to communicate to each other or to the station when the internet goes down or when there's an emergency and the, broad, you know, the bandwidth is, is sucked up by people sending messages. You want your own separate system. Similarly for the critical infrastructures I just talked about, you don't want to rely on internet connectivity, you want to have your own system. And as we discussed, we want this to be secure. Now, this is exactly what it is. It's a system, uh, proprietary, um, and in order to keep the algorithm a secret, um, manufacturers had to sign a non-disclosure agreement uh, before they got the specifications. They then had to implement the uh, algorithm either on hardware or on software, but then make sure that it's not possible to reverse engineer it. Now I say it's not possible. Of course it's possible, right? Um, all you can really ask is that they make it very difficult to reverse engineer. The three guys involved are uh, Carlo Meyers, Wouter Boxlach, and Jos Wetzels. Where are they from? Anywhere? Uh... Uh, they might be from the same country as me, <laughs> but that's a total coincidence. Um, but at least I can pronounce their names. Um, so they spent quite a bit of time and effort reverse engineering um, the protocols and the, the implementation thereof. Um, because, of course, there's multiple manufacturers, all it really takes is one manufacturer to not quite secure the system as well as they should have in terms of being able to reverse engineer it. Uh, so they were able to find a machine with an implementation that had some weaknesses that were exposing bits and bobs of the internal workings, um, and they were able to exploit that to, to find out what the code is, what the algorithms are. And then step two, they analyzed it. And what they found was not very good. They found a whole list of weaknesses and vulnerabilities, several of which were bad, but two of which were really, really bad. So I'm going to be talking about the two that are really, really bad. Um, so the first one is um, a vulnerability that exists across all implementations of Tetra. Um, Later on, we're going to talk, be talking about one specific implementation, but this one is true for all of them, which is why I would say this is the worst one. Um, 
So all cryptographic primitives used in Tetra are proprietary and they're all stream ciphers. So a stream cipher is one of two major types of uh, symmetric encryption. Uh, one is the block cipher. The anal uh, analogy is um, you're chopping a file up into bits and pieces and then scrambling them together. And your secret key tells you how you scramble it, but also how you unscramble it. A stream cipher is different. Um, a key is used to generate a long stream of bits and this stream of bits can then be used as a so-called one-time pad. So how does that work? Well, let's start with a naive stream cipher. So we have some key and we're using this key as input to some magic box and then the magic box outputs a stream of bits. Let's call them B0, B1, etc. Then we have a message. Our message, of course, is digital, so this is also a sequence of bits. Let's call them M0, M1, etc. What we can then do is we can take the bitwise exclusive OR, um, and what that does is it combines the bits in a, in a reversible way, uh, such that we get a secret message. This is our ciphertext. Um, so the ciphertext will then be uh, C0, C1, etc., where the bit CI is simply determined by taking the ith bit from the bit stream and the ith bit of the uh, message and taking the XOR. Now the XOR is a bitwise operation, so if we have 0, XOR 0, what it does is it compares them and if they are the same, the output will be zero, but if they are different, the output will be one. Another way to think about it is that um, we have a message M and the bit B, and the bits determine whether or not we're flipping the bit, right? So if this is our original message, we say we have a zero, XOR zero, we're not flipping the bit, so we're keeping zero. One, XOR zero, well, we have a one, we're not flipping it because it's zero, so we remain one. Or we have zero, but now we XOR it with one, which means we flip the bit, so a zero becomes a one, and a one becomes a zero. That's how you can think about it. Now, obviously, if you XOR a message twice with the same bit string, you get your original message back. And this is, of course, exactly what we want. So, in other words, we can get our message back by taking our ciphertext and applying the same stream cipher. So now all we need to do to communicate in secret with each other is make sure that we agree on the same bit stream, the same key in this case, right? Because the key is generating the bit stream um, and we both have the same one. So I XOR it with the bit stream, you take that result XOR it as well. Um, and now we agree on the same message and we've communicated to each other in secret. Can you see potentially a problem here? Um, the key is the, the problem, surely. The key, how you generate that thing if, if you don't get that key right, is that? No, it's not how you generate the key, it's actually how you use the key. Uh, okay. Because let's say that I'm running the same protocol tomorrow. What will the bit stream be? Oh, the same. Well, it will be exactly the same. And this is of course a massive problem yeah. because I can take the two ciphertexts and XOR them with each other and the bit streams will cancel out and the result will be the XOR of the two messages. In other words, if I have two ciphertexts with the same bit stream, we get, let's say, MI XOR BI, that's M is our first message, and then we XOR it with the other ciphertext, let's call it M prime I XOR BI, well, XOR, you can move the things around just like with a plus. So we can move these two together and they will cancel out. So the result will be MI XOR M prime I, which means that if I know something about M prime I, I know something about MI, right? So I can use this as a, this is called a decryption oracle. And so if I can manipulate the values of M prime, I can learn the values of M. And this is a big problem. This is one of the worst things that can happen. So, instead of using a single input, 
we need to use two inputs. The other input being a so-called initialization vector. This is not a secret, unlike the key, but it's a fixed value that changes every time you use it. So both parties will know if we're using the stream cipher in this context, this will be the IV, and this is immutable. So that means that I cannot manipulate the IV to be the same tomorrow as it will be today, so we're guaranteed to end up with a different bit stream. Now, I think you can see where I'm going with this. The implementation of Tetra doesn't do this correctly. Um, what it uses for the initialization vector is some information that can be found in the uh, data frames that are used in the protocol. So, in particular, it will be a sequence number relating to the frame, as well as the current time and some other information that's not so relevant. Now, what the attacker can do to trick um, the system is they can reset the um, sequence number because the sequence number increments every time people communicate. So I can just come up with a sequence number that was used in the past and the system thinks, oh, something must have gone wrong and then resets to that point, something it shouldn't be doing, but it will. Um, and that means that now the same initialization vector can be forced by the attacker to be used by the system, which means stream reuse. And this is a total break, right? It means that we can pretty much read everything, insert messages, do whatever we want. And we didn't use any of the properties of the proprietary implementations of the cryptography. We just used the way the crypto was used. So that's the first break. The other break has to do with the actual implementation of the system. The system uses various implementation of the cryptography. These are uh, handcrafted crypto, which is usually not a good idea, right? You want to use the publicly existing uh, cryptographic primitives simply because they're well tested, they've been used, they've been studied, um, and any weaknesses that are potentially still there are going to be very difficult to find. Um, here, perhaps not so much. So they have four uh, primitives that you can select, uh, TEA1, TEA2, TEA3, and TEA4. Now, TEA2 is only allowed to be used by nations that were associated with the European Union, um, because the Standards Institute Etsy is a European institute, um, and they simply restricted export to only Europeans and friends, effectively. Um, then uh, TEA3 TEA um, had a more liberal definition of friends, so it could be exported uh, more widely, um, but not to countries that, that we wouldn't consider, well, that the EU wouldn't consider to be, to be friends. So think of countries like Iran in particular. Um, so these countries were forced to use TEA1, there's also TEA4, but it's not quite clear who the intended audience for that was, and it seems to not really be used. So we'll ignore TEA4 for now. Um, and it was TEA1 that was fundamentally broken. Um, so in part because of export restrictions um, that were uh, there in the 90s in the US, um, there was a limit on how big the keys could be. So the key that TEA1 uses was 80 bits, which is probably enough, right? If, if you use it properly, it should be enough. But they weren't allowed to use all 80 bits. So the protocol actually selects 32 bits from those 80 bits in, in some way. Um, and those 32 bits, we can call it the truncated key, those 32 bits are actually the bits that are used in the protocol. So the protocol is running on a 32-bit key even though the input key is 80 bits. But that means it's brute forcible, right? So if we can enter the calculation at the stage of the truncated key, we can just try all two to the power 32 combinations and see which one it is. Um, so that's, that's really bad. Um, then to make matters worse, um, the way in which the truncation was done allowed researchers to even try to figure out what the original key was based on the truncated key. Um, so TEA1 is completely broken, um, and part of the reason why it's broken 
was because of export restrictions that existed in the time. Now, a mistake like this could not have survived scrutiny, right? Anyone looking at this would immediately say, hey, this is an issue, this is not a secure protocol. Um, and in fact, in some communications about the very system, people were saying, well, it's actually only 32 bits, so we're allowed to export it to Iran. That's why I'm mentioning this example, um, because that's a country that has these, uh, to which America has these export restrictions. Um, so, what, what did we learn from this, right? So, the authors have reverse engineered a system. So, from this we can learn why it's a bad idea to try to hide the implementation of a protocol, right? These are three good guys that have reverse engineered it, immediately took action, you know, warned people, um, and waited until for publication until the system was mostly fixed. Have other people found it in the meantime? Certainly, I would imagine so. Um, nothing you know, negative to say about these three guys, but I'm sure that any organization with a bunch of smart guys in this domain that really wanted to do this would have been able to, to reverse engineer it um, and not necessarily tell anyone about this. So this could be a criminal organization, this could be a security organization. So you're never going to be able to keep your secret protocols actually secret. Um, so that's one thing we can learn. The other thing we can learn is that um, the lack of scrutiny allows these vulnerabilities to exist for much longer than they should have. Countries, um, in organizations, uh, etc., were all using weak versions of a protocol for decades, and God knows whether or not there were bad actors that had already knowledge about certain techniques to, to abuse the system, right? We will never know this. They, why would they tell us, right? Um, so fortunately, these three guys have you know, taken the effort to reverse engineer it, which I think is a really cool um, thing to do, then figured out how the protocols worked, found some weaknesses, and I would really expect um, people that are more sort of experts on uh, this sort of crypto to be able to find some additional weaknesses and vulnerabilities in addition to, to what they have already found. I did see a report on this, uh, Tim, and, and it said something about a deliberate baked-in backdoor. Is, is that something that was also there, or is that one of these vulnerabilities? I mean, the fact that we can even speculate about this being a po uh, possibility is an issue, right? Um, there have been instances in the past of this happening. It's not clear at the moment whether it was a deliberate backdoor. Um, the, the authors do mention a, a suspicious um, S-box. Now, we don't really have to know what an S-box is, but it's a small part of the cryptographic algorithm, and it's working in a strange way. Now, whether this is intentional, accidental, or, you know, uh, nefarious, we don't know. But the point is, the fact that this thing has been there for 25 years without anyone knowing about it is harmful in and of itself. So this one goes all the way over to here, this one goes over to here, and so, and, and so on. Remember, this is going to be a, an iterative process, and what we want to do is move these things around and permute them. Exclusive OR gate, with two inputs A and B. The output of those is called the sum. It's the sum in that column. 